Hello and welcome to season two of the LuxCast, where we explore the intersections of Christian faith, culture, and our lives. My name is Chuck DeGroat, professor at Western Theological Seminary. In this season, we dive deep with significant thought leaders, pastors, authors, and other interesting conversation partners as we explore one key question with each. Today's one question goes to Dr. Daniel Costello, Associate Professor of Theology at Seattle Pacific University in Seattle, Washington, and author of The Apathetic God and Pentecostalism as a Christian Mystical Tradition. Dr. J. Todd Billings sat down to ask Daniel about theodicy and the problem of evil from a Christian theological perspective. I'm excited to be here with um, Dr. Daniel Castello, and we're having a discussion today about theodicy and the place of um, the problem of evil from a Christian and Christian theological perspective. Um, maybe I'll start with a couple snapshots from my own life on this. Okay. One was um, as a undergraduate, I had a class, a philosophy class, and one of the first things we learned about there is the problem of evil. And as we discussed it after class with other students, um, a number of students are really surprised. Why haven't we solved this problem yet? Okay. Um, and then some other students are saying, oh, we have solved this problem. You know, we've come up with a solution to this problem. Um, but it seemed kind of astonishing that there was still this, this problem and the, 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 calling it a problem indicated mm -hmm. that it needed some solution. That's right. Um, the, the other snapshot is um, after um, my cancer diagnosis, mm -hmm. I um, read quite widely in um, some literature about the Psalms as well as about the problem of evil and theodicy. And I found your Theological Theodicy um, book mm -hmm. really, really helpful. Oh, um, but I also found that I was asking different sorts of questions mm -hmm. than the questions that um, I and the other undergraduate students were asking. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't quite, I, I didn't have the same sense as a cancer patient mm -hmm. um, that there's this problem that needs to be solved in quite the same way. Right. Can you speak into some of your own um, reflections, how it might intersect with one of those snapshots or both of those? Yeah. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here, Todd. Thank you for having me. And um, I think the, the tendency to categorize this as a problem is a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's part of the problem. <laughs> that's part of the problem, yeah. right? What, what are the conditions, <clears throat> what are the factors that lead us to think that we can do that uh, with uh, this particular issue? And by framing it as such, it raises all kinds of expectations. It buys into all kinds of ways that we think and process. And really, uh, I, I'm of the opinion that it ill-equips us uh, to deal with things that affect us indirectly at some point in time, for instance, like a, a particular kind of diagnosis, right? Uh, because by labeling something a problem, it elevates it to some degree of abstraction. Uh, yeah. It assumes mm -hmm. that uh, we can, like you said, solve it. And mm -hmm. then there's a certain uh, host of temperaments or sensibilities that come with that, um, impatience, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Frustration that if this expectation is set up a certain way and not being able to solve it, then maybe uh, frustration leads to dismissing it or to discounting it. Uh, and so I think that the way that these matters are framed uh, really affect us at, at, a, at a personal level, a moral level. Um, and I would even argue at an intellectual level to mm -hmm. the degree that we can deal with these things um, in, in terms of their scope and in terms of their effects. In, in various situations besides the classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What resources do you think the Christian theological tradition has in thinking through this nexus of questions, even if we don't call it, you know, the problem of evil? Um, mm -hmm. When I was first introduced to it, it was um, all about, it was um, all framed in terms of a theistic God. It could be mm -hmm. any monotheistic religion. Yeah. Um, and that's how the problem of evil was um, set up. But are there resources in the Christian tradition for um, 
engaging this nexus of questions? Sure, I, I think that uh, an emphasis on the economic trinity and all that that implies uh, would be helpful uh, in terms of uh, both the, the incarnate son and the abiding spirit. Um, so really reclaiming our, our language, our theistic language, that this is, we're not talking about- a, Trinitarian language. Right, our, yeah. our Trinitarian language. So that we're not talking about an abstract God, but mm -hmm. a God who's alive, who's real, who's active. And by doing that, it does raise the pressures then, um, theodical pressures that, well, if we're naming our God and we believe this God is active, then where is this God in, in terms of our, our moments of suffering or pain or, or lament or so forth? So this is, um, I think that would be one of the resources, would be a claiming of the Christian God and this God's name, um, um, highlighting of this one's acts in history, uh, what this one has done and hasn't done. Um, I, I think that that's a good orienting um, um, uh, perspective in, yeah. in this. And also, uh, you mentioned in your book, uh, lament. I think that's something that's really uh, very crucial. And I have to admit to you that um, in reading about lament and thinking through about lament was one thing, but when I had to participate in lament uh, from an institutional perspective, it really changed mm. my view. And mm -hmm. I'm referring to uh, a couple of years back, we had a shooting on my campus. Mm. Mm. Um, this person just showed up and, and, and shot a, a few students and killed one. Mm. And the one that he killed was a student of mine. Mm. And he was a first year student and I'd had him, uh, I believe the, the quarter prior uh, in a mm. Christian formation class. Wow. And so the first thing that we did as a community was we gathered together in worship and uh, we started reciting these, these psalms mm. and uh, these mm. prayers. Mm. And one of our long-term uh, faculty members um, our Old Testament scholar uh, preached at that time and, and, and calling upon us to, uh, to lament, uh, to ask the question why, not to shy away from it, and also to support one another and to not hold uh, anger towards the shooter. And so all of that happening uh, in a public setting, yeah. in a worshipful setting, really was quite impactful to me. And so I'd st even in talking about lament and trying to say that the problem, uh, or problematizing evil or thinking of evil as a problem, saying that's one thing, but then in an activity like this, an mm. experience like mm. this, it really um, impacted me further um, because it's something that one has to participate in. One has to be active in not just um, deliberating or talking about it in, in some distanced way. And so, that, that experience impacted me further to, mm. to realize we do have these resources and they have to be utilized. Uh, they have to be brought to the fore corporately and uh, liturgically. And in doing so, I think it can, it can be a formative experience, uh, not just an enlightening one in some sense, but a formative one mm. Uh, mm. moving forward. If, if something like that should, should happen again or some other things happen, that, that experience of, of living through lament and corporate worship at a time like that can maybe uh, influence um, uh, one as one proceeds in, in other situations. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. It seems like in some of the discussions of theodicy, if it was to end up with lament, it would seem kind of like a failure because you haven't answered mm -hmm. the problem. Right. Um, but um, if it's in terms of Christian formation, if I'm understanding you right, um, both lament as well as doxology and worship is some of where we do want to end up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, how do you help students who may come in wanting a rational answer mm -hmm. um, move in this direction that you're speaking of, particularly in terms of the, as well as the spirits the Spirit's work and Christ's work, how it relates to their Christian faith. I try to foster some patience and some understanding because uh, typically uh, when students are raising this in my context, undergraduate students, well, there's not necessarily a whole lot of life experience for most mm -hmm. of them to draw on. Mm -hmm. And um, and also potentially there's this 
perceived need by wider um, arrangements to protect them or, or so forth, who knows? But there's a sense in which maybe not a lot of life experience is going into it. And so I, I try to be mindful of that uh, because that, that is a factor in the room yeah. when we're talking about these matters. One of the strategies I use pedagogically is to try to deconstruct that expectation of why it would be a failure not to have an answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, there are reasons for deconstruction at point. There are, there are some necessary deconstructions that have to happen. And I think in, on, along the lines of this topic, um, it is necessary to deconstruct that tendency that we, if we can't explain it, if we can't make sense of it, then somehow we, we can step away from it or it's not important. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and really it, it's a deconstruction of a certain kind of privilege, a certain hmm. kind of, uh, of understanding of power. Hmm. Um, that, that life owes me this, God owes me this, or? Yes, uh, yeah, yeah okay. those kinds of things. Um, that um, I'm entitled to a, a long and healthy life, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that this is part of what it means to be a Christian. I, yeah. I'm a Christian, so therefore I, that comes with certain benefits yeah, or entitlements. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, It was very startling many years ago, I had a student uh, who was talking about the Christian faith and as she was talking about it, she was talking about it as an insurance policy, hmm. really. Yeah. I mean, she was saying, you need to get things right in your life uh, so that if things go badly, then you, you have something to fall back on. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. she's talking about it, and of course she's being sincere, but I'm thinking this is what you would say about an insurance policy, right? And so um, constructions of the Christian life as a whole, um, perceptions of God, constructions of the Christian life, what do we sense um, is at work and beneficial and about this this life, those things have to be addressed um, because I think there are so many factors in in this context, in our American Western context, that uh, lead us to think that we're consuming things or that uh, somehow we commodify things, and that's how we attribute value to them. And I think that plays into our spirituality as well. Hmm. Hmm. So, whereas um, in many times in history and parts of the world. Um, not just certain types of suffering, but even death and dying yeah. is common in all ages. And, right. um, you know, there's um, sometimes in an American Western context, the sense that um, if you don't live until your 70s or 80s mm -hmm. or 90s, that um, somebody owes you something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah. so, um, Certain certain parts of the of what we see as the problem of evil are kind of aggravated by mm -hmm. this privilege. Is that? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. I think so. I think that's a big part of it, and and also just in terms of the the way that that we go about thinking through these matters, the way that we go about evaluating these matters. I mean, these this is not just, it doesn't happen just at church. That's one of the things I would emphasize. The, the way that we appreciate these things, not just through reading the Bible, not just through what our pastor says, but really just a lot of other factors. And it's a bit tough, I, I think, uh, at times to, to go through that process of identification because it's a little painful maybe that um, we might be in the process of deceiving ourselves and not know it. Or there's mm -hmm. all kinds of ironies that, um, that are at work, and yet we, we don't call them out necessarily, uh, maybe mm -hmm. because we don't have to, right? Mm -hmm. But Jesus didn't live a long life, right? right so what's, right. The, what's the sense of having that expectation if we're Christ followers, right? Uh, and um, it, it, so it's the sense of, of having the courage. Again, this is a, a moral dynamic of having the courage to perhaps um, look at matters differently and realize that um, maybe we're perpetuating certain forms of deception or mm. that we're mm -hmm. participating in certain contradictions mm -hmm. uh, that um, have these long-term consequences that we may not realize it until something happens wrong yeah. or it's inexplicable, and then we wonder what's going on. Right? Almost a kind of denial of our creatureliness and That's some right. and our limitations. That's a big part um, of it, yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that's another factor too, is, is the recognition of our limits and our creaturehood. And so another thing that I try to do, which again, it's interesting that this could be characterized as being morbid, but I remind my students they're gonna die. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're all gonna die. Uh -huh. and, and so let's just, let's be honest about that. Uh -huh. And let's think intentionally about that reality we will all face. Yeah, 
Yeah. I, recently, I was speaking to a group of college students, and I just said, you know, all of us are going to die. All of us, mm -hmm. you know, you are mortal. And afterwards, several students came up to me and said, that's the first time anybody has ever said that to me. Mm -hmm. um, almost as if they didn't realize that before, but mm -hmm. there's something about um, contemporary Western culture that pushes yeah. so far mm -hmm. um, away from that. Yeah, I would characterize that partially as, as gospel. Uh, that's good news because it's the truth. Hmm. That's the thing, mm -hmm. right? And I think we as Christians are called to be lovers of truth, to mm -hmm. be attentive to the way that things are. And if there are things that are allowing us to, to perpetuate lies or to deceive ourselves, well, that's anti-truth, that's anti-gospel, hmm. right? Hmm. Um, and so that's not to, to, make, to assume that death is altogether good, but it is a feature of our creaturely uh, existence, um, this side of heaven. And so this yeah. is something that we have to account for. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to ask about. Um, that One thing that I really admired about the theo Theological Theodicy book was um, I had read a number of books where, you know, they take up cases of um, difficult circumstances. Um, how could God allow this to happen and mm -hmm. so forth? And, um, I mean, there's things that happen that just seem senseless to us. Mm -hmm. And um, so there were some theologians who said, um, you know, it's senseless to us and I don't want to implicate God in this, and so it's senseless to God as well. Mm -hmm. And um, one move I saw you making was um, a more humble one. Mm -hmm. um, you admit that we don't have the answers. At times, the things that happen are senseless to us, mm -hmm. um, but you don't say, and it's senseless to God as well. God couldn't have done anything about it. God has no purposes. Mm -hmm. um, but it's much more um, God has not <laughs> given us um, right. this final um, answer. Mm -hmm. um, um, so it's left in God's, um, it's left in God's camp, <laughs> mm -hmm. in a sense, to... Mm -hmm. um, um, <clears throat> rather than solving the problem of evil by saying God couldn't have done anything or couldn't be working right. through this terrible thing. Right. Um, it's much more mysterious, it seemed like, mm -hmm. the way that you were describing, mm -hmm. in, in that we let God be God. And mm -hmm. um, um, could you describe that move? And if I've, if I've mistakenly described it uh -huh. in some way... Um, Feel free to correct. No, that, I, I, no, yeah, I, I think you're spot on. Uh, there's a humility tied to this, and I don't think I named it this way in the book, but there, there is an eschatological tension yeah. uh, of, of where we are and what we anticipate things will be like, and but shrouded, and all of this is shrouded in some kind of ignorance from our end, right? Hmm. That we're hmm. being trying to be attentive to what we have. We believe that God's given us these gifts, these resources, these means of grace, to, to use the mm -hmm. language in my tradition, um, and we are to live into those, but as a result of living into them, we don't always have all our questions answered or all of our concerns addressed in some yeah. fashion. And so it's a tension on the one hand, I want to allow there to be space for that tension to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think oftentimes corporately or communally, we have a hard time living in tensions, and, mm -hmm. and some people step over that boundary and try to explain, mm -hmm. or in the, in the language of comfort, uh, right, they, they try to say something, but, but really, um, to keep those questions alive mm -hmm. and the tensions available, I think, mm -hmm. is, is helpful for both those who are suffering and for those who are around them trying to support them. Um, so keeping the questions alive, and at the same, same sense, or in the same way, uh, to keep questions related to God alive and the tensions alive as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that it is our role as Christians to, to defend God in some ways that when we don't even understand God, mm -hmm. right? I mean, just mm -hmm. let those questions open and leave them open. And I don't, this is not in any way trying to be uh, irreverent, but there are really certain things that God and only God can answer mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or that God 
and only God can account for. And that doesn't mean that I, I think less of God as a, as a result, but it is something that um, being mindful of, of what I can know and can't know, mindful of what yeah. God has given me to know about God's self, um, these are life tensions that, that I think we all live with or that we should live with in the sense be, be, instead of stepping into those spaces and somehow explaining it from God's end right. or somehow explaining it from our end. Mm -hmm. So you can end up with a kind of wonder and silence mm -hmm. before God on some of these as opposed mm -hmm. to, um, oh, this is how it happened from right. God's end. Or obviously God could not be you know, doing this or... Um, on, on our end, but that's right. It, it leads to a kind of worshipful apprehension. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. seems like that's a right. Faith. And yeah. allowing the space for God to speak for God's self, yeah. right? If not now, later, of mm -hmm. what what purpose certain things had, or how God was at work in a certain situation. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. Well, it's thank been you. Great to <laughs> chat with you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. All right.